It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm here, as always, Austin Peterson, co-hosting with Landon Mance, and we are excited to have in studio, or not actually in studio, but uh, on the show with us today, Leah Martin with Leah Martin Law, all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada. Leah, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited to uh, have a conversation. You and Landon have obviously, based on uh, our conversation before, known each other for a while. Um, but I don't know you that well, and our guests don't. So we try to start with having you tell us a little bit about yourself personally, talk about your family, talk about your history, and kind of what led you to where you are today. All right, sounds good. So I am originally from Southern Indiana, um, grew up in a mining community, coal mining back there. And we lived there until I was 12. Um, it was, you know, the tumultuous 80s of the economy of, um, you know, environmental regulations starting to kick in. Things were challenging. So unfortunately, my dad was laid off a large amount of the times because of mine closures. So ultimately, um, in 1989, he was recruited into the gold mining industry in northern Nevada, which is what brought us to the state. Um, and I lived in Elko, Nevada through junior high and high school, which is a really kind of interesting experience, small town, tons of opportunity. So if you wanted to do something, you really had an, a chance to do it, which I think so many kids don't have today because it's so competitive to engage at a high level in any activity these days. Um, so kind of, kind of some of the cool parts about that too was with my dad working in the mining industry, I had a chance to also work in the gold mines during um, summer winter breaks during college, which was a very interesting experience. I knew manual labor was not for me after that, um, for sure, if I didn't know already. Um, I also knew that, you know, kind of field work, I did the environmental department one season. Um, it wasn't really gonna be my thing either. It was adverse weather conditions. I liked the cushy office environment a little bit more. So, um, I was already in college at the time. I was on the path to get my bachelor's degrees in environmental studies and political science at UNLV, uh, which I did in 1999. And from there, I went, stayed at UNLV for law school at the William S. Boyd School of Law. Graduated there in 2002, completely sure that environmental law is what I wanted to do with my life. There's not the biggest market for that in Las Vegas, however. And this is where I intended to stay and you know raise my family. So I um, made the decision to just go into a firm that did general commercial law. I was in litigation for my initial years and I loved it. Um, although after a period of time, I kind of didn't really want to fight every day of my life anymore. So I've kind of evolved over my career. And since opening my firm in 2011, I'm really focusing on more of the business transactional work. Um, we do have litigators on my team. I try not to be one of them anymore if I don't have to. Um, I have two daughters, they're 16 and 18, and a husband. And we live here in Las Vegas. I've really never left since 1995 when I landed here. It's one of those cities that's hard to leave. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think there there's some things that, that you and I certainly have in common. Uh, I grew up in a blue collar family. My father was a stucco contractor. My uncle was a stucco contractor. My grandfather was a farmer. I spent my entire childhood doing manual labor and it taught me the same thing that that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, day in and day out for my career. I have brothers that chose to do that. That was what they wanted to do. And they're having, you know, great careers as well. Uh, it just wasn't for me. And so, you know, I, I appreciate that. And a couple things that kind of came to the surface for me is, you know, not being a Nevadan. Uh, don't they call Nevada the silver state? It seems to me that that would be silver mining, not gold. Am I, am I wrong there? I think there's some of that too, but the modern mining is more dominantly gold mining these days. Huh. 
Interesting. Hey, uh, Austin, sorry, I, I have to jump in so I, I don't forget to ask this question. So Leah, I think that is one of the coolest things that we have heard on this show yet. You were a gold miner. So how do we not ask you, did you find any gold? And if you did, what did that, what happened? Tell us about it. There was no gold to be found in my work. No, I did a lot of carrying sandbags, you know, helping with welds, things like that. Um, but not, none of the glory of finding gold. The mine I worked at was microscopic gold. So I don't think anybody saw a whole lot of gold. Um, we saw a lot of chemicals that were you know, processing the ore to try to dig out a little bit of gold from it. Okay. So you guys didn't find any, you know, golf ball or softball size gold nuggets? Regrettably, no. It would have made for a much more interesting experience. But you know, I think Austin, kind of going back to your point, by having those opportunities and, you know, doing the different kinds of jobs, that's how we can see what we like. And so many people today, like, you know, we all have teenagers in our households. Um, you know, I think people do a lot less jobs as young people today, and it's hard to know what you like until you do it. Yeah. Well, I, I think the answer she wanted to give to you, Landon, was that the greatest treasure in her life is her husband and children, and she didn't need to find a big pot of gold. True story. <laughs> <laughs> read my mind. Yeah. Oh, boy. All right. Well, Leah, I think, you know, obviously it's a it's an interesting route that you've taken. Uh, I have a brother-in-law that's a, that's a litigator as well. He worked for Morrison Forster in Los Angeles. Uh, for a long, long time. And now he works for a Korean law firm, but he, it's basically business litigation that he does and, and actually does it internationally. He loves it. Uh, he enjoys it. I don't know that he spends a ton of time in the courtroom, but you don't have to be in the courtroom, obviously, to be litigating or arguing uh, over certain things. But um, it, it's just something that that he's learned to enjoy, but not not every attorney is built that way, right? Yeah, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lifestyle choice. Um, you know, I think at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, in a five month span, I had three trials and a couple ARBs. Um, and, you know, you aren't sleeping, you're not eating regularly, you're not taking good care of yourself. And when you have a family, especially, that really becomes a huge challenge to be effective as, you know, a parent, effective as a business owner when you're not there. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So that kind of makes me think about, you know, what with where you are today and you've gone through some different iterations and obviously studying uh, environmental studies and thinking you're going to be an environmental lawyer and really just having to switch to to litigation. If you had to pick, what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Well, I think if I thinking back to my college experience, if I had known how much math went into being a business attorney, um, especially in the litigation world. I would have studied accounting, not political science. Um, you know, environmental studies was a lot of fun. It was a passion of mine and it still is. But, um, you know, political science, kind of useless in my career. Like, nobody <laughs> really cares if I had that degree. It doesn't help me in my day to day life. Um, but accounting sure would have helped because, you know, if I'm looking at, you know, tax returns or profit and loss statements or, you know, a QuickBook ledger of any sort at, at a trial, I can analyze it. I'm pretty good at numbers, but it would have been helpful to have that background. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That does make sense. And not, not really anything that I've thought of, to be honest with you, from a business attorney's viewpoint. Um, it certainly comes into play. We see it in our business every day. And so it, it's kind of a second nature for us, but from an attorney standpoint, uh, that's an interesting view on things. So I guess I have to ask a follow-up question. Do you then now have an accountant on staff or you've self-taught yourself to the point where you're, you're comfortable with those numbers now? You know, coming into my career, I had no idea, like I said, what a profit and loss statement or balance sheet was, but I think through, you know, reading, working with business coaches and working with a whole lot of expert witnesses, I'm pretty savvy on those issues now, but it's a lot of work self-teaching. And even with a degree, you have to continue to self-teach throughout your career because that's just, you know, things change. You have to continue to grow, but I, it would have put me way ahead at that point. Yeah, definitely. Landon. Yeah. I was just going to, I was going to ask, um, 
You know, one of the things that uh, I have preached on this show and uh, I preach to young, young people um, all the time uh, that are either in college or coming into college is to, um, uh, is to do, oh my gosh, Austin. Um, An internship? Internships. Yeah. Internships. I'm a huge proponent of internship. Going back to what you just said, Leah, um, you know, a lot of young people don't know what they want to do, um, especially when they're, um, uh, when they're doing their undergrad work. And um, I think that internships are a fantastic way to um, get your feet wet in different industries. Uh, obviously, it can open some doors into, into future potential jobs, which I think is wonderful. That's actually how I got into the career that I'm in now. But um, uh, I'd love to know, like, what what advice would you give a younger Leah that uh, is interested in, you know, in studying law? Uh, maybe they're graduating from high school or they're in their first or second year in college. And uh, what advice would you give them to kind of help, you know, um, maybe not avoid the mistake that you made, because I don't think that's a mistake, but just to maybe have a, a more productive path to becoming an attorney. So I think that you're absolutely right. Exposure in whatever way you can get it is super helpful. My full extent of legal knowledge going into even probably, I mean, I guess definitely undergrad at least, was John Grisham books. That was all I knew. And it sounded so glorious and fun. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, I never, until I got to law school, I never worked in a law firm or anything like that. So I really didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into, like what it all meant. It just sounded like, you know, if you got good grades and you're smart, that's the thing to do, go to law school. Um, so I think that the more you can learn along the way, that's really good. Um, also, I think that there's a real, um, issue with a lot of high schoolers, especially with the online school that they're experiencing now with COVID, the study skills aren't really happening as much as they should. Um, so I feel like a lot of kids today aren't establishing the discipline to really thrive in a harder educational level. So they're getting by, but there's not, you know, the skills being learned. Um, you know, the, I feel like a lot of kids aren't reading on a regular basis today. Um, like fun books as well as, you know, school books, because I think it's just, if you're going to go to that advanced levels of learning, you're going to have to read and you're gonna have to read a lot. So you need to be really proficient in the comprehension and the speed and everything else. So I think just, you know, reading every day is super helpful, actually putting in the work to learn, not just skate by because it's open book and you don't really have to apply yourself is really good. It's learning how to learn. And I think um, that's where a lot of people have a challenge. And as you go to different levels of learning, you have to learn how to learn all over again because, you know, undergraduates different than high school, which is different than um, law school was for me. So I think putting in the time to learn how to learn in order to do well is probably the most important thing. And, you know, the skills we learn in high school and college and graduate <clears throat> school, the most important ones aren't the substance of what we learn, because that's all things we can look up. That's, you know, that's things that we can, you're probably not going to need 90% of it anyway in the long run, but the, the, the skill we should be learning is how to think, how to apply and how to, you know, just, you know, write and convince and persuade and do all those things. Yeah, so now now you push some buttons for me because we we talked before the the show started and you know we're both in the thick of raising teenagers. My oldest is a little older; he's twenty, almost twenty one actually. Um, and we talked a little bit before the show. He's coming back into the country, but a couple of things that stuck out for me is is one you talk about you know if you're if you're smart and you and you can study well and you get good grades, then you know law school is where you should go, right? And obviously there are other avenues, but I was in that same boat. Law school is where I was sure I was going right. uh, until I took an entrepreneurship and stock market class in ninth grade as an elective. And it changed my entire life and my entire thinking. And I realized that's actually my path for me. 
So mine came in ninth grade. Landon's talking about the internships, which I think are are phenomenal. Um, we actually learned, or actually Landon wasn't there, but I was on a call last week with the producer of our show, Karen, where we did kind of an end of the year celebration for everybody who hosts a radio program on Business Radio X. And one of the radio hosts talked about her intern that is coming in for the podcast and helping with certain things. And so next week, my son that's just getting back into the country today is going to come to the studio and be there while we produce this show. Not that it's what he's going to do from a sports journalism standpoint that he's studying right now, but it gives him an idea of what it, what it's like to be behind the mic, what it's like to interact with somebody, what it's like to, to ask good questions, what it's like to be able to listen to that response and then have a way to respond to that. Those are skills that kids just don't have as much of today because of the technologies that exist now, even worse with the digital learning that they're doing. And I could go on for hours about how kids get through high school. You know, my kids are both pretty smart kids, but you know, my son showed up at for his first semester at Arizona state smart kid did fine actually when all was said and done but had no idea how much effort was going to have to go into college compared to high school. My kids have both been able to get great grades all through high school without having to study much. And that's a disservice that we're providing to our kids today in the educational system is they're not truly prepared either for their career, for trade school, or for the university because our school system just doesn't prepare them for that. So I'll get off the soapbox now. Landon's rolling his eyes thinking, yeah, these guys with older kids, you know, yeah, I have a stepson, but you know. Yeah, I was going to say, you tend to forget <laughs> that I, I've, helped raise, yeah. I've helped raise my stepson since he was nine and he's now 18. So, um, and, and my stepson is very similar to me in uh, the... Uh, let, let me elaborate on what I mean by that. Uh, in the um, uh, the pursuit of education and studying, and he he's he's a very smart kid, but um, his application to school and studying is almost non-existent. So he just kind of scoots scoots through with you know an assortment of of different uh, grades, which. I was exactly the same way, so I can relate to him. Uh, that's how I got through high school and college. I, I was never a big studier. I just kind of scooted through, did the bare minimum to, to pass and you know move to the next level. Um, but my wife can't relate because she was uh, you know a straight A student all through elementary school and high school. And she took the initiative, you know, herself to, to study and prepare and to do all of that stuff. So uh, she has a harder time with my stepson because they are so different in uh, that regard. But it's easy for me to, to uh, relate and sympathize to him because I was the same way. Of course, I, I want much more for him, uh, but I, I couldn't agree with well, both of you guys anymore that we high school does not prepare us to be efficient and effective students. It just doesn't. And uh, we've had this conversation with several guests on, on the show. And we've talked about, you know, the different paths that kids can go, whether it's college or to a trade school. Austin and I are big proponents of trade schools as well. And, you know, we need more, <laughs> more kids that are uh, going into, uh, you know, blue collar professions because there's still a lot of opportunity there. But um, anyway, um, a, a follow-up question, Leah, um, is, you know, um, we've all made mistakes. We've all failed um, and it's helped to build our character and to get us all where we all today, get us all where we are uh, today. Uh, Love to hear maybe one or two of your biggest failures and um, how that's helped to shape you into the successful lawyer and business owner that you are today. So I think that my biggest one, it was probably, well, let me give background first. I'm like the most type A person, like 
ever. I make lists on lists and, you know, I have plans for my vacations for like the next five years in <laughs> detail with itinerary, like minute by minute. So that's the kind of planner I am. And I decided to open my firm like the day I quit my job and I was like, I guess I'm starting a firm. So um, no plan at all. Um, which is out of my character for sure. But, you know, I did it. I jumped in. I got going. I did all the things. I did the steps. But I really did not know what I was doing. Um, so, like, starting a business, I always say, is not the time to be like, just do it. Like, don't go with the Nike theme. Just do it. Like, you need a plan before you actually start. So, I was not well equipped to start my own business. I didn't know the fundamentals of running a business. I know about business from being a business litigator, but not from you know, actually having studied it or done it or read about it or anything else. So I really, really struggled through my first couple of years of this business ownership. Um, you know, I was definitely subsidizing the law firm, you know, through my other, my savings and my husband's earnings and different things. Um, and so it was just really a challenge for me financially, mentally and everything else. And a friend of mine who's also an attorney finally was like, you know what, you need to make a decision. Are you serious about doing this? Or do you need to just go find a job? Um, because she saw how much I was struggling. And I was like, you know what, let me think about that and get back to you. <laughs> um, because I was, you know, at that time, just not really sure that, that this is what I should be doing. Maybe I wasn't built for, you know, owning a business. I was, I had interviewed a couple, you know, times with the university for different positions and things. So I wasn't like 100% mentally committed. So I thought about it and, um, you know, gave it a little time and decided, yes, I was going to make this happen and I was going to make it successful. So then I started just like reading like everything I could get my hands on about all things business, you know, the finance side of it, the marketing, um, you know, motivation, kind of anything that I could think of for whatever I was struggling with right then. Um, and, you know, with that, I also got a business coach. And I think that that is one of the best things an entrepreneur can do at various stages in their, you know, their journey as a business owner. Um, early on, they can be super instrumental in helping get things set up the right way. But along the way, we all hit roadblocks. And so I've had, you know, different coaches over time for that were best suited for what position I was in then and what I was struggling with then. And then looking to the outside resources, like I clearly did not know what I was doing with doing my own books. So, you know, at that time I got an outside bookkeeper to come in and help get it cleaned up. And then I had someone on my team to do it. And I'm, I'm good with numbers. I'm good with math, but I was trying to do everything and I was doing nothing well. So I think that's, you know, in, in addition to don't just do it, um, you know, don't try to do things that aren't in your wheelhouse. And don't try to do the things that are taking you away from doing what you are supposed to be doing. So for me, you know, billing is kind of important, but so I need to do the high level business things, but going to the post office and, uh, you know, doing runs to the court and things like that were cutting into my ability to really succeed as a business owner, as an attorney. So I really had to build up a team to support me so that I could do a good job for for them and for my clients as well. So, you know, get help, get support. It'll it'll really pay for itself. Yeah, I love that. That's some that's some excellent advice. Now, this is a totally unplanned question. Okay. And uh, I hope I don't uh, de derail our our conversation here. But this just came to me, and I thought that you would have some really good in input or advice here. Um, one of the things that I have been uh, personally studying a lot um, on lately is um, rather than starting a business from scratch, uh, acquiring an existing business with an intent of doing things better, right? Mm -hmm. um, growing the business and, you know, improving operations, et cetera, et cetera. So, in your experience, because you have, you have and continue to serve a lot of private business owners and going through the experience of starting your own practice, what would your advice be
for somebody that is looking to start a business uh, because I, I think the the failure rate of people that start new businesses, I believe is like, I want to say it's like 90% failure rate or maybe it's it's 70% failure rate the first year and then 90%, I believe within the first three years. And, I, and don't quote me on those numbers, but the point is it's very high. And so with all of your experience serving private business owners, buying and selling businesses, what advice would you give to somebody starting a new business? Would you advise them to maybe start from scratch or would you maybe maybe give them advice to maybe buy something existing and improve upon it? I think there's definitely benefits to both of those options. Um, you know, if you're gonna do kind of a start from the beginning, I really recommend that people do that after, like if they can do it kind of part-time initially, that's optimal. Um, so one way that I kind of subsidizes my, subsidized my startup was I did a lot of contract work during my first couple of years, mm. which basically made it where I was building my business part-time, but, but working for other people the rest of the time. And that was a great way of doing it because I was able to kind of keep paying the bills um, thanks to all the people who hired me to do contract work and then build my business. And that was great until the time when I could no longer accommodate my clients and that workload. So I think that's a really good way to do it. And a lot of people, I think during the COVID um, situation have really taken that on and said, you know what, I've been furloughed, I've been laid off. I'm maybe not fur furloughed or laid off, but I'm really nervous about the long-term prospects of this employer and this job. So they've started up those side businesses now um, and kind of had some money coming in, which has really helped with that because, you know, almost all businesses are not going to make a lot of money that first month, three months, six months, year. So, you know, you've got to be able to survive that. So that's one way to survive it. Now, if you have a safety net of, a, of savings or family, that helps. But I do think that the slow start is a really good thing. Um, you know, having a, a plan and knowing what that budget looks like of how long it's going to take you to get profitable, how much of, you know, whether it's widgets or hours or how, you know, however you quantify your earnings, how much of that is it going to take to get you to a point of profitability that you're going to be able to survive? Um, how long is it going to take you to get to that number per, you know, week, month or whatever the measure is? Um, and can you survive that? You know, how are you going to get to that point? So, you know, I think that it's easier to do a slow start on a startup that's truly your startup, because anytime you're buying a third party business, you've got to have money in the bank ready to at least make a down payment on that. And then a way to get a loan for the rest, unless you're able to get the seller to finance. But I guess in this economy, you're probably going to see more sellers willing to do that because they just want out. But um, not that the economy is bad, it's just a little uncertain <laughs> for a lot of people right now, especially if you're like in the restaurant space or, uh, you know, the bars or gyms or, you know, the ones that are more challenged right now. Um, so, you, you know, I think it's a great way to get started, but I, for me, I would see it as a great way to get started if you're jumping into a parallel market you know, like if I was opening up in another state, I might want to look to acquire a firm that's already existing in that state. Um, I see a lot of that where, you know, a business in one community or state will acquire a business in another area to expand their footprint. Um, it can also be good if you're kind of trying to expand your scope a little bit, but maybe not, um, you know, have to start all over. So you'll see, you know, maybe a HVAC company that really has the licensure to have an, an you know electrical company that'll acquire that type of company so that they can expand in the same community without doing all the legwork. So I think that it's a great way to expand, especially if you know there's a motivated seller. Um, it can be even more beneficial. But um, yeah, I think it's always great. Now, anytime you're buying a business, there's a lot more to think about too, as far as you know, are you buying just the assets of that business or are you buying the business itself? And the concern when we, you know, do a business purchase is you don't necessarily want any liabilities that's coming alongside that. You know, have there been 
lawsuits or their financial issues? Is the IRS going to come knocking on your door for unpaid taxes? Um, you can avoid a lot of that by doing just an asset purchase. But you know, if you're in a specialty licensed area, like a contractor's license or things of that sort, that may not really fulfill what you need. You may need the actual business license that ties to that prior owner. So I, there's no easy answer. I think, um, you know, a lot of people like the, it's my baby, I created this from the ground up, um, but it takes time. So you have to be willing to put in the time and, you know, ride it out for those five years or 10 years to get to a point where it makes sense to then possibly sell it. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's actually made me think of about, uh, oh, let's call it 16 or 17 more questions. <laughs> um, but let's, let's take an opportunity to take a quick break here from our sponsor and then come back and we'll, we'll dive off uh, or dive in a little bit more on some of the things we've already talked about. If that's all right. All right. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We're here with Leah Martin with Leah Martin Law in Las Vegas, Nevada. And before the break, we were talking about, uh, you know, the benefits or drawbacks of starting a business versus buying a business and the things to look out for, which, you know, the first thing that it makes me think of is really, you know, given the time that you've been doing this, what would you say um, is either the best piece of advice that you would give to somebody who's starting or acquiring a business or, or maybe both, um, the most common mistake that you see from a legal standpoint that business owners make? So I would say the most common mistake, I'm going to start with that piece of it, is they just get so excited about the opportunity that they aren't looking at the big picture to see what the concerns are. Um, you know, I've had clients where they'll give me some of the due diligence materials to review for a business acquisition, or it, maybe they're acquiring just a, a portion of the business. And I look at it and I'm like, 100% no. And I don't say that often. Normally I'll say, I'm going to caution you that, you know, I have some concerns because of these things. If I say absolutely no, it's a really bad situation. You know, there's multiple lawsuits, judgments. Um, there's money coming in and out of the accounts that I can't I articulate why um, and where it's going and, you know, things just don't make sense. But that doesn't mean they're going to listen to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they should. They're paying me really good money to yeah, give them this advice. But, um, you know, people get so excited that they don't want to hear the bad. So, you know, I would say really do the due diligence. Know what you're getting. Um, like dig in on the finances. And if something doesn't make sense, and you can't get the answers on why it is the way it is, walk away. There's other opportunities. So, yep. um, you know, I would just, that's the biggest thing. Don't get committed 100% to something until you know that it makes sense. Um, and the same is true with a startup. You know, if you run numbers and you put together a budget and you put together a marketing plan and you do all of these things and you, don't have, you know, numbers that look like they make sense and you're going to be profitable um, or you don't have like as big of a target market as you thought you did, go back to the drawing board. You know, don't start something that you can't be fairly sure you're going to be in that 10% that survives that that five years or three years that Lance was talking or Landon was talking about. Um, you know, set yourself up for the most, you know, likelihood of success. That said though, I have other clients that come to me and say, hey, do you think this business will be profitable? Is this a good idea? And like my crystal ball is broken. I, I cannot give <laughs> that advice. And I, you know, I keep going back to in our current market, in our, you know, in this COVID era, but it's especially difficult to project what's going to be a successful business right now. So, you know, I my biggest thought on what is going to be successful now. Businesses that require minimal capital to start up are great options right now because you're really mitigating your risk. If you, you know, want to start up something where you're going to have a $10,000 capital, you know, need in that first three months to six months, 
and you think that you can start making money by the end of that six month period, great. Like that's pretty low risk. You're, you've got $10,000 and some time on the line. But if you need a million dollars to start up something right now, I would be a little bit concerned unless you have experience in that market. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the best thing people can do, and this goes back to, you know, Landon's suggestion earlier of the internships is get experience in the, in the market. You know, you may have a passion for something and think that that's where I want to do business. I want to open a restaurant or I wouldn't open a store, but if you've never worked in a restaurant and you don't know, like, you know, the back of the house type of tasks, as well as the front of the house, you know, it's going to be really hard to manage it. So I think it's good to, if, you know, if you think you want to get, you know, be a restaurateur and you want to get into that market, you know, spend six months to a year or two years even working in a restaurant, doing the things, um, you know, go be a, a line cook for a while. And then, you know, maybe you can be a hostess and just do all the different things that are going to help you learn the business you want to get into. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you hit a, an important point there and, and you actually learned the hard way yourself that just because you were a great lawyer, a great litigator, a great business attorney, didn't mean that you were prepared to run your own firm. And that, that's a huge mistake that we see all the time. And, and don't think for a second that I, didn't, that I didn't catch that little slip where you called Land and Lance. He, he tells me that people do that all the time because of his last name, Mance, but you and I both know it's because he looks like Lance Bass and everybody <laughs> thinks that he's Lance Bass. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, it does just kind of roll together, but you may have something going there, Austin. That one just came to me. That's how I, that's how I roll, Landon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a, I got a quick, uh, I guess it would be a, a comment, but I want to, uh, just to kind of piggyback on what Leah was saying. And I, I just had to Google this while you were, uh, while you were talking, Leah, because uh, Mark Cuban I knew that he had said something uh, about passion and I think it's kind of relevant. And he said, um, in order to be one of the best, you have to put in effort. So don't follow your passions, follow your effort. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, that that was just worth saying because, um, you know, Austin and I have a lot of conversations with our business owner clients. And we also, have conversations with people that uh, are clients of ours that want to start businesses. And a lot of people think that um, in order to start a successful business, that it has to be something that they're, that they're passionate about. And um, uh, we also talk about how just because you're a good crafts person, right? You're really good at your craft. You're really good at being an attorney doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be really good at, at starting and running, you know, a law firm. Right. Um, so Austin, and I have that, that conversation, uh, with people as well. So I think that that is, uh, that is some sound advice that you, you don't necessarily have to follow your passion. You have to follow something that you can put the effort into and that you have created some path to get from where you are to where you want to be and have a roadmap or a plan that is going to, you know, that's going to help to uh, get you there. And I think that the, you know, there's, you really need a lot of discipline along the way too, to kind of follow on that. I just finished reading The Power of Habit, which was a really, um, you know, good book on, you know, you just have to do the things. You have to follow the steps and do the things and create the habits to have success. So do I love reading invoices every month to send them out to clients? No, but that's how the, you know, what we have to do to then generate the income. Um, you know, so we have to do the things that aren't always fun to be able to, you know, have create the success in our businesses that we really are doing this for. Yeah. And that, that, I think that's a good segue into the next question I have for you. You've alluded to, um, uh, business coaches and some other things that have helped you, you know, become successful as a business owner. So maybe you can share with us, you know, what are some of the other resources that you've tapped into that uh, have really helped, uh, you know, propel your business forward? So, 
you know, I did mention I, I do a lot of reading um, and, you know, the audiobook world is lovely because there's so much out there now and we all spend time in our cars, maybe less these days than we used to. Um, but, you know, I run, I spend time, you know, getting ready in the morning and during those times when it's just me and I'm by myself, I spend a lot of time listening to audiobooks. So one of the commitments I made this year was one business book a week. So whether that's a physical book or an audio book, I think it's that the habit of constant learning. Um, and, you know, you're not going to, not everyone's going to be a winner. Not everyone's going to be interesting, but if you can get one tidbit from every book, I think that's going to help you and your business. So that's one of the things I do. Um, and I've done, you know, different types of, like I said, business coaching, I've done masterminds. Um, I think that can be really helpful because it's a peer guidance um, on your situation. So instead of somebody telling you what to do, you have others kind of picking your brains and helping you think about your situation. So I do like mastermind type peer groups as well. Um, I don't, I've not um, used them personally, but I do send a lot of people to um, SCORE. I don't know if you guys are familiar with SCORE, but it's a wonderful resource for people who are especially looking to get started with businesses or you know new businesses and um you know i do presentations for them pretty regularly but they also beyond that have mentors so i think that's great for people who are looking to get started they'll help people craft their own business plans and just figure out if what they're wanting to do makes sense so a lot of people come to me without a real business plan or really anything other than an idea so i direct a lot of them to score, to help them get to the stage where they're really ready to get started. Um, so, and I think that even, you know, having a team, like I mentioned earlier, having a team with the different skills that maybe you're not the best at can be super helpful to help, you know, it doesn't have to be an internal team. It can be, oh, hello, the lights just went out. Um, <laughs> it can be um, outsourcing to, you know, a third party that provides administrative services or billing or, you know, clerical, whatever it is that you don't have the time or the skill set for, you know, use your resources and, you know, you'll have a much greater success. Yeah, I, um, well, now I'm going to draw a blank on which book it was that I, <laughs> that I listened to, but, you know, the, in this, in this book and forgive me if you're listening the the author of this book, but you know, it, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but the reality is what he says is if it's not your core competency, you, you should delegate it to somebody else. Right. And if it's super important to the business, then obviously you have to delegate it in the appropriate way. So that, you know, like you mentioned billing earlier. Well, I mean, if, if billing isn't being done and revenue is not coming in, the business doesn't survive. And so, you know, it's, it's important. So you've got to have somebody you can trust, to do that, but delegating is a huge part of taking a business to the next level. Business owners are typically not very good at it. You know, Landon and I see it all the time with our business owners where they get to a certain level and they just cannot get past that level. And it's because they don't know how to get delegate and how to grow from that level. So I think that that's a, that's a huge point. And then the other thing that, that I really agree with 100% with what you said is coaching or mastermind groups or CEO groups, you know, anything that you can do to get an outside perspective to help you see what you're not seeing yourself as a business owner, because we're all smart and capable individuals, but having a different viewpoint from somebody who doesn't have an agenda that doesn't work for you, that doesn't have a vested interest in giving you their feedback on how you should grow your business or something that you're dealing with can be super uh, helpful in building a business. And I think that with those types of groups also, you have accountability. You have somebody who you go back your next month or whenever your interval is, and they're going to say to you, hey, did you do this thing that you committed to? Yeah. And, you know, you don't want to be the person who has to say, no, I did not live up to my commitments. So. Yeah, yeah you know, I agree 100%. On the delegation, I would go even one further than, you know, your core competencies. And I would say as a business owner, if it's not a task that no one but you can do, you should be delegating it because yeah. we have, you know, such finite time to do all the things that go into running a business. So I think it's important to delegate all of those, you know, whatever it is, as many things as you can possibly delegate. I'm like the best at delegation because I like... <laughs> I like to do as little as possible. So, um, you know, I delegate everything, not, not all business stuff, but 
you know, I think it goes to the home too. You know, if you have a lot of responsibilities at home, I don't need to clean my home or not make the dinner necessarily or whatever. I can outsource that. So yeah. why do that when I could focus that attention to the things that only I can do? Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and honestly, that's one of the reasons that I have somebody who does my yard work at the house, because in order to do it right, it takes so much time and effort from me to do that. And my time can be spent better elsewhere, whether it's just that I don't have to do it so I can spend more time with my family at that point. And then it didn't, I didn't take away from my family or maybe I was doing things during the week and now I have that free time to spend with the family because I allowed somebody else to do that for me. I could do it way cheaper, right? I mean, I can buy a lawnmower for what I pay them in one month, but in the long run, it's better for me and for my family, for my work-life balance to do it that way. And so I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Leah, well, can, I, uh, can I make a suggestion for your next audiobook? Yes. So I just finished what it takes uh by steven schwartzman he was the co-founder of blackstone oh, nice. which uh you know is one of the largest companies in the history of the world um, and it was really really good so i would uh i would suggest that as one of your next audiobooks um uh, let's let's shift gears here leah as we kind of start pressing up against uh, time a little bit um there's a lot of misconception, misconceptions and myths um, regarding your profession. And uh, can you help us to uh, debunk, uh, you know, one or two of the uh, myths that you come across frequently? Sure. So, I, you know, we're not all sharks. We're not all mean, awful people. Um, now, I think anybody can be a little bit harsh at times. And I, you know, most attorneys are going to run up to times where they can't be the nice guy. But, you know, in my experience, 95% of the attorneys, at least, are really nice until they can't be nice anymore because of the situation they're in. So, you know, have I, you know, made witnesses cry? Maybe. Um, have I made people unhappy? Definitively, yes. But, um, I try not to. I want to be help people, and I think almost all attorneys want to help people in whatever discipline they're in. So I think that's probably one of them. And I think a lot of people don't understand how it works with attorneys. You know, with most attorneys, I mean, you have your areas where it's contingency, you know, personal injury, things of that sort, or flat rate, you know, some of the criminal, some of the bankruptcy type stuff, but most of it is hourly. Um, so it doesn't have to be overly expensive to have an attorney help you with something, depending on your situation. Many attorneys will give free consultations. So, you know, I think it's, it can be scary to go talk to an attorney if it's something you haven't done before. But I think that, if, you know, it's a good idea to just kind of overcome the fear, get a free consult if you're in a situation that you're uncertain of legally, and then see what the estimate looks like and what, you know, if it's something that's viable to have that legal help. Because, yeah, I don't think DIYing, um, the attorney realm, like the legal work is a good idea. What, what about the myth when it comes to buying and selling businesses that lawyers kill deals? <laughs> okay, well, lawyers are gonna probably kill deals that shouldn't happen. <laughs> So with the example I gave you earlier, um, you know, if I see super fishy things, I'm going to kill the deal. Um, if I think that there's clauses that need to be put into a contract for the purchase or sale of, of a business, I'm going to bring it up. But ultimately, it's my client's decision if they think that those clauses are important, if they want to hold out for those things. So, you know, I'm all for those buys and sales to happen. You know, I want it to happen, um, but I want it to make sense for everybody that's involved. So, um, you know, if it's going to mean that we want to have indemnity clauses, we're going to want to have non-competes, we're going to have, you know, want to have all of those, you know, security for that purchase price that the owner's carrying um, or the seller's carrying. So if we can't come to reasonable terms on those things, then yes, I'm going to probably suggest killing the deal. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, we talk about it most, mostly in a, 
in a transaction uh, relationship, you know, like buying or selling a business, but um, it, it can be true really in any kind of a business relationship where we talk about how both parties should be equally unhappy when they walk away from the settlement table, right? Absolutely. And and that's actually a, a win, believe it or not, right? And so it's it's an interesting approach. And obviously we've seen it from both sides of the table. We've seen it as an attorney. Um, the other thing I I want to mention that is similar to us is that there's you know, there's myths about what we do for a living too. Like so many people believe that we just sell life insurance and annuities and mutual funds and, and that's what we do. Right. And, and it's one of the biggest frustrations that Landon and I have is trying to differentiate ourselves and help people understand that that's not what we do. Landon and I do the exact same thing that you do. We, we offer a free consultation. We charge fees for our advice because we're offering professional advice and it doesn't have to be that costly to get professional advice and doing these types of things on your own can be very detrimental. The cost of a mistake is way bigger than the cost to engage our services. Absolutely. Yeah, for you and for us. So I have to get this question in before we get to the end. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? So it ties right into what we were talking about. I think I would have something along the lines of, do you really want to DIY your legal work? And then have like images of a lady like dyeing her hair and it gone bad. <laughs> and then maybe like somebody tried to fix their plumbing and it like water spurting everywhere and like, maybe a tax return with like an IRS notice next to it because they did it wrong. Like if you wouldn't DIY those type of things, why would you try to do your own contract? You know, it's not that you can't give guide like thoughts on what you want in it or even do an initial draft and have it reviewed. But I went to a lot of years of school to you know, learn my legal skills. Um, and I've been doing this for, you know, close to 20 years. So I think that it's just the a smart thing to at least get advice, even if you don't have an attorney do all of it for you. Yeah, I agree maybe 100%. We can, uh, maybe we can uh, co-sponsor a billboard with you and uh, we'll, we'll add the image of the, you know, the do-it-yourself uh, investor and the, the perils mm -hmm. that come along uh, with that, so. Right. <laughs> yeah except that I can actually pull off a do-it-yourself haircut. Landon can't. <laughs> true, true that. All right. So one more question for you, and then we'll ask you to give us the information on how people can get a hold of you, um, LinkedIn, website, whatever it is. But what's the best compliment you've ever received, Leah? So, gosh, I early in my career, I was probably – like five years into my career, I was still litigating. Um, and another attorney that was on my case, just not, he was not exactly my direct opponent, but he was also another attorney in the case, sent an email to my supervising attorney, just telling him how I reminded him of another well-reputed attorney who's now a judge and um, at, at that stage in her career and how I put in the work and I you know, made the effort to go in there well prepared. And I think that's for me, one of the best things, you know, the best compliments you can get. You always want to be well prepared for the things you take on. And that can be hard, um, especially in litigation, because so much flies at your flies your way all the time. So I think that was a really great compliment for me, because as a young litigator, you may not always get you know, all the glory, you get sent into kind of the junky stuff sometimes um, because the partners want all of the real glory ones for themselves. So right. I, I thought that was, that meant a lot to me. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's awesome. You're right. Cause I mean, at that point you were probably doing a lot of the grunt work, like you said, pulling the case law and, you know, putting everything together. And then the partner sits at the table and says everything that you told him or her to say. And they get the glory. So yeah, I think, I think that's awesome. You know, just not to toot my own horn, but the, I, it made me think when you were speaking of something that, uh, that happened to me along the way, and this was probably, oh, probably eight years ago, one of my clients passed away and his wife was obviously there. And then their children were there and I'm, I'm there, 
you know, kind of letting them know what finances look like, delivering a life insurance benefit and explaining to them what the rest of their lives are going to look like because of the planning that I had done with their husband or father. And the wife was there all along. But when that meeting was over and she stood up and she threw her arms around me and gave me a hug and said, thank you. We love you. And I'm thinking, whoever tells their financial planner that they love them, right? But it's one of those things where a lot of times what we do, even though our clients appreciate it, it can somewhat sometimes be thankless. And in that instance, it wasn't. So it's, it's an awesome feeling when that happens because they're few and far between quite a bit or, you know, quite often. Absolutely. Less, less hugs these days, especially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, especially. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, Leah, tell us how to get a hold of you. Uh, website, LinkedIn, any of that kind of stuff, phone number. Or I'm sure we have listeners that could, uh, that could benefit from your services. All right. So um, our phone number here is 702-420-2733. My email address is lmartin at leahmartinlv.com. And my website is leahmartinlaw.com. And, you know, LinkedIn, I guess search me because I don't really know what my handle is on that. So you search me, I'll accept your friend request or your connection. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure they will find you on Leah Martin Law. Landon, anything you want to add before we close out? Well, I just um, thank you for the conversation. That was a lot of fun, really productive, and we got some some good nuggets to take away. And I can uh, assure our listeners that reach out that Leah is, in fact, a very nice person. So um, don't don't let uh, don't let that uh, deter you from reaching out to her. So. Again, Leah, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We really appreciate you coming on and we look forward to hearing about your uh, future success. Awesome. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.